Do you think that in your life there might be unconscious priming that's happening around you that you're completely unaware of? If we divide as humans, we are easy to control. And be in control of your own brainwashing. If you're not in control of it yourself, you're still being brainwashed. The question I have for you is, do you think that it's possible that you are being subconsciously programmed and you're completely unaware of it? Does that scare you? Would it make you pay more attention to your surroundings and every single thing that you did if you were subconsciously being programmed completely out of your awareness? Well, you just might be. And I'm going to give you a couple stories that make you realize how possible it is and how little people understand what's actually going on. So I'm going to give you a couple stories about it. One of them, there was a study that was done about something called unconscious priming. Unconscious priming, you can Google it, you can look it up if you like to, but Yale did a study to see if they could change the way that somebody feels about something simply by the temperature of the coffee that they're holding on to. And so what happened was they had these, these uh, students come in. They would come in and the researcher would meet them down on the bottom floor and they would say, hey, good to meet you, da 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 da. And then what they would do is they would say, they'd hop into an elevator and they had a lot of stuff in their hands. And they would notice, the researcher would notice that their shoe was untied. And what they would do is they would have, you know, they go, hey, can you hold my cup of coffee for me real quick? And so they would hand them the cup of coffee. They would put their stuff down, they would tie their shoe, they'd pick up their stuff, and then they'd get the cup of coffee back from them. And then, the person that was part of the research, but didn't know that they were part of the research at the time, that was part of the study that would go in and they would read a one page story. And it was just a, a typical story. And then they were given a quiz, real quick quiz at the end of it, where they were told to answer questions about the person. And, you know, so they would take one character from the story in the one page, and then they would answer questions about them. And, you know, all they would do is they would, you know, answer the questions, then they would go. And what they realized was this, was that even though they had just held a cup of coffee for about 15 seconds at most, it changed the way that they felt about the people that they were reading about about 15 minutes later. So here's what happened. The people that were given an iced cup of coffee, because there was iced cup of coffee that was handed to people, and then there was a hot cup of coffee that was handed to people. People that were given the iced coffee felt that the character that they had the questions about was much colder, less social, and more selfish. The people that were handed a hot cup of coffee for the researcher to be able to tie their shoe felt that the person was warmer, more social, and someone that they could trust. So let me pause right there. These people were given a cup of coffee one, of a, one set of people were given a hot cup of coffee, one set of people were given a cold cup of coffee, and across the board, statistically, the people who were given the cold cup of coffee felt that the person was cold, less social, and more selfish. The people that were given the hot cup of coffee felt that the person was warm, more social, and somebody they could trust. So if they're given literally 15 seconds of holding onto a cup of coffee, and it changes their perception around the world around them and everything that they think about people, what is happening in your world that is changing your perception? Think about that for a second. How crazy is that, that just a simple temperature of something that somebody holds for 15 seconds can change the way they feel about people 15 minutes later? All right, I got some more stories, I'm not done. So there was also researchers that went in and they had uh, students come into a room and they had them answer questions or, or actually come up and see how creative that they could be, right? And what they didn't realize was that some students went into this room and they were, they constantly, like three or four times they saw the logo for IBM because IBM was just, you know, it's IBM is seen as a typical standard company, not very creative, but there was, you know, they, they said, okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put something up on the board and they'd turn the computer on. They'd see the IBM logo. It would be right there. And then they'd be, okay, this is what we're going to do. And what they had people do was figure out as many uses that they could use for a brick besides what a brick is normally used for besides like throwing through a window to break the window besides you know building a house any of that type of stuff what can you how can you be creative so they had people see the ibm logo three or four times before they were asked the question to write down what it was that they could come up with you know non-typical uses for a brick and then they had another set of people that instead of seeing the ibm logo 
they were they saw the Apple logo. And it wasn't like they're like, hey, this is an advertisement for Apple. It was just like they happened to see it. It was either in the room somewhere or it just popped up as they went to go ask them the questions. Now, if you look at the two companies between IBM and Apple, if you were to look at the two of them, you say IBM is a pretty typical company, not very creative, not outside the box. You don't really see a lot of advertisements for many of that type of stuff. When you look at Apple, Apple tends to be a very creative company. People tend to think that they're a creative company. They trust them a lot. They have creative packaging. They love a lot of, you know, there's people that are hardcore about Apple. I don't know too many people that are hardcore about IBM. Here's what's crazy. Exact same situation, just different logos that they saw. The people that saw the Apple logo found three times more uses for a brick than the people that saw the IBM logo. Isn't that pretty crazy? Simply because people know that they're, when they deal with Apple, Apple is more creative. So when they saw the Apple logo, they became more creative in all of the uses that they could find. And the reason why it works like this is because your brain doesn't just have like one part of the brain that lights up. So the same place that the brain where Apple lies inside of your brain can connect other neurosynaptic connections in your brain for creativity. And it starts working together. The same way that when you hold on to a cup of coffee and you feel cold, it's, it lights up a certain part of your brain. And that certain part of your brain has other neurosynaptic connections around it. So when you see something, it doesn't just affect one part of your brain. It affects many parts of your brain. It's not just like one part of your brain turns on and the rest of it is off. And so it depends on what's actually lighting up inside of your brain. Another example of how this is used is grocery stores. Here's something that's really interesting, okay? One of the best that, I've, that I find as far as grocery stores that deal with people and uh, the way they, they skew and change your perception around everything is Whole Foods. Whole Foods is one of the first ones to do this. When you walk into a Whole Foods, what do you almost always have? I, I'm thinking of Whole Foods that I walk into that's right down the street. Flowers, right? Flowers and fresh produce. Why? Because they want you to feel that this is a, a, a fresh place to walk into because when you walk into a place that has flowers, you can smell the flowers, you can smell the fresh produce. It makes you feel as a human, like we are sensory organisms. We see a bunch of really bright, beautiful colors. We smell a bunch of beautiful scents. It actually turns on parts of your brain to go, oh yeah, this is great. I really like this. This is, I feel fresh in here. I've never walked into a grocery store and all of the dead animals and flesh was in the front. Why? Because that'd be a really weird place to put it. Where do they put the meat in every single grocery store? In the very back. Why don't they put the meat in the front? Because that's not how they want you to walk in. They want you to walk in seeing beautiful colors. They want you to walk in see, smelling beautiful scents. They don't want you to walk in and just see dead animal parts right there. And you know, I'm just telling you honestly how it is. And so what happens with the fresh flowers, with the fresh scents, everything, is it makes you a little bit more hungry and at the same time, makes people feel better when they see beautiful colors and they smell beautiful scents. So. If this is what companies are doing and able to do with you at all points in time, do you think that in your life there might be unconscious priming that's happening around you that you're completely unaware of? Absolutely, 100%. The best psychologists in the entire world work for advertising agencies, right? And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, and I'm just trying to make you aware of what's happening so that you can start to program yourself, and that's what we're gonna do today. But advertising agencies know that at the core of every human fear, like fear that holds you back, at the core of every single one of them is the feeling of I'm not enough. And if I won't, if I'm not enough, then I won't be loved. And so advertisers know this and they exploit your psychological weaknesses. And what happens? They know the feeling of I'm not enough is what's usually at the core of most people's fears. And so what they do is they make advertisements to make you feel subconsciously like you're not enough until you buy our product. Simple, it makes sense. That's how they start to sell more. If you want to know more about this, there's a, uh, a, a beautiful documentary. It's like four hours long. It will blow your mind. Uh, that's called The Century of Self. I believe that's what it's called. Uh, pretty, I'm like 99% sure that's what it's called. The Century of Self. And it goes through talking about how it used to be before like the 1940s. It used to be that people would, 1940s, 1950s, people would buy stuff based off of if they needed it. And then a lot of psychologists learned about psychology and human behavior. They came into advertising agencies and they started to actually use the advertising and the psychology in advertising to make people stop buying things that they need and make them buy things that they want. 
And so uh, the perfect example that they give inside of this, the century of self, is that there was, a, I'm gonna try to remember this because it was about two years ago that I watched this, is that uh, pre-1950s, cigarettes were seen as something that only men smoked. So women weren't really ones who smoked this. And so uh, so there was a guy that came in and the guy that came in was actually the, uh, the um, Sigmund Freud's nephew. He was Sigmund Freud's nephew and he came in and he's like, I'm gonna come in and help you with the psychology behind this. Because if you're only selling to men, you're missing out on an entire 50% of the market that's out there. How can we change the perception and start selling cigarettes to women so that women can start, you know, start start consuming them and so what happened was they came up with this big campaign and they uh what they said is there's gonna they they had these women and inside of these women were there's this big massive like thanksgiving parade or something like that and so they had the women go and they were walking through and they they went to all of the news outlets and they said there's going to be a line of women who are going to be, uh, they, I think they called them suffragettes is what they called them. And they said they're going to go and, um, and, and have, have freedom torches that they're going to show to take over their power, take their power back. So they're gonna have freedom torches. And what happened was they went to all the news groups. There's gonna be these women, they're gonna have freedom torches. So the news group's like, what the hell's gonna happen? We gotta see whenever this thing happens. So as soon as they're walking, there were these women that were in these, these dresses they had inside of their, uh, inside their, their dresses, they had cigarettes. And so all at once, when they got in front of all of the news and media outlets, they took out their cigarettes, they lit them in front of every, everybody. And that was the way that women, to, in this perception of, of what happened here, took back their power to be able to smoke cigarettes and say, it's not just gonna be men that are gonna smoke cigarettes, it's gonna be women as well. And that alone sparked women smoking cigarettes from the 50s on. And so they knew how this psychology worked. It's mind blowing when you start to see how psychologists are in advertising and actually hijack your system and exploit your psychological weaknesses. So once again, I'm not saying this to be doom and gloom. I'm saying this so that you can understand that your mind, if you're not very self-aware, is able to be hijacked very easily by people who understand how your mechanisms in your brain work better than you do, right? And so you've got to start thinking about these things. If an advertising agency can make you feel differently just by watching a 30 second ad to make you want to buy their product, if a grocery store can make you feel differently based off of the stuff that you see and the stuff that you smell, if a brick can you come up with three times more uh, uses for a brick simply by the logo that you see walking into a room? If, you know, a company if, or if a, a school can make you feel differently about someone that you read in, on a piece of paper simply by the, the temperature of the coffee that you're holding on to, then there's millions of these things happening around the place and you've got to be very aware of what's going on. This is one of the reasons why I tell people not to watch the news because the news is hijacking this system like crazy right now. It's also why I tell people not to watch stuff like reality TV, you know, people that are yelling at each other and terrible people and, you know, the the Kardashians and all the shows that are happening where people just, they don't seem to treat very people very well every time I've seen that. And also when there's like the, what, the housewives of whatever place they all are at now, that what happens is when you're watching these things, it might be like, oh, this is just a mind, you know, I've, I was busy all day. I just want to watch something that's just entertaining. You've got to ask yourself, is this just entertaining or is this making me feel better about myself and the world around me or worse about myself and the world around me? You know, is the news keeping me informed or is it keeping me conformed? And then you also got to start thinking about the people that you surround yourself with. You've heard me say before, and you've heard everybody say before, you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. You know, if you hang out with five people that are extremely fit, you're go even if you're not in shape, you're going to get in shape simply because the same way that all these things get into your brain, all of the people around you are going to get into your brain in certain ways as well. Oh man, they're fit. I'm fit. Subconsciously, you're going to go, I should actually start working out more. They invite you to go work out. You start showing up because you want to feel better about yourself. You want to fit in with the people that you're around. You know, if you hang around five people that are completely out of shape, you're probably going to be the sixth. If you hang out around five millionaires, you're probably going to be the sixth. If you hang out around five alcoholics, you're probably going to be the sixth. You know, so you got to think the people that are around you, how are they programming you, right? The people that you follow on Instagram, is it pro programming you in some sort of way? I always tell people, go through your newsfeed, go through the people that you follow. Just now that you know that this is a thing and start removing people that you feel are not good for your own personal psychology. Now, the reason why this is important and this shouldn't be something that disempowers you, but something that empowers you is because when you realize that this is how the world works, this is how your brain works, you can take back your power and you can use it the way that you need to. So you can go, okay, beautiful. This is how it works. 
I understand that this is my, my system being hijacked. I understand that this is going to affect me this certain way. The music that I listen to, is it something that makes me feel better? Or is it something that makes me feel worse? Is this how I would talk to somebody in real life? Or is this just something that I say when I'm all alone and I, want, I don't want to say this when my mom's around, or I don't want to say this when my girlfriend's around, or I don't want to say this when people that I respect are around, right? You start thinking about every single thing that you do. You start thinking about the people you hang out with, the music that you listen to, the ads that you see, the, the, the news that you watch or don't watch, the food that you eat, the places that you shop, and you start to become very aware of, oh, that makes sense now. Oh, that makes sense now as well. And it's not doom and gloom. It's actually empowering because you go, you know what? I'm going to surround myself with all of the people, all of the stuff, all of the, the music, all of the, the podcasts, all of the YouTube videos, all of the books, all of the people that are going to get me to a better level of who I want to be. Because if anybody can hijack the system, why can't I hijack my own system? Since I'm in the system all day long, why can't I hijack my own system to create the life that I want, to become the person that I want to become? Because ultimately, every single thing that you do is unconsciously priming you. Every single, every single thing that you're around is unconsciously priming you. So you've got to ask yourself, am I in control of my priming? Am I taking control of it? Or am I just leaving it up to chance? Because when you're very self-aware of this and you're very intentional with it, you realize that everything in your environment can either empower you or disempower you to create the life that you want to. So be very careful and motivate yourself, inspire yourself with every single piece of content, every single thing that comes into your brain, every single thing that you see, hear, interact with, all of that stuff. And eventually you're gonna realize that you consciously primed yourself to become the person that you want. The other day, last week, I was in the paint store and I don't watch the news, I don't watch TV, I don't even have you know any TV stations that could come in. Got Netflix and YouTube, that's basically all I watch on my TV in my house. And I was inside of the paint store and I won't tell you what station it was on or any of this stuff, but what it was on was it was on a very popular talk show won't tell you which one it is. And it happened to be on a station that the talk show was talking about a lot of things that were very politicized. And um, every time it would go to the, the commercials, the commercials would have a news flash, like little break that would happen. And it was another thing that was going on, right? And what I became aware of in this moment, obviously I've known it, but to be able to actually see it, I was in there for about three to four minutes. And I was like, I wonder what they're actually gonna be talking about. And it was so blatantly obvious to me that this station was trying to push their propaganda to make you think and feel a certain way. Now, I'm not saying what station was, any of those things. But what I'll tell you is, no matter what side it is, whether it's the left or the right, whatever it is, they are trying to have a war for your mind by throwing out propaganda and things and making the world seem a lot worse than it actually is. Right. And within three to four minutes of being in there, I became very uncomfortable because I was like, I can literally feel how other people that don't know this is going on can think that the world is absolutely terrible right now. Think that the world is absolutely going to shit to think that there's so much to be afraid of. And I've got to pick a side of what side I'm on. You know, I've got to be on this side. And when I pick a side, this is important to know when I pick a quote unquote side, that puts me on one side, which means that there is always an enemy, which is the other side, right? And it was so obvious that this one side was trying to push their agenda and push their agenda and push their agenda. And to somebody who is not aware of what is going on, they are going to be extremely easily influenced into number one, thinking the way this side thinks. Number two, seeing that there was a side that is against them that they need to be fearful of. And number three, think that this world is going to absolute crap. So there's a couple of things I want to pack out, you know, pull out of that and, and, and unpack. The first thing, why is the news so negative? And I, if I've done episodes on this before in the past. The news is so negative because as a human, our brains naturally go towards what is negative, AKA what is wrong. Why is that important? Because 10, 20, 30, 100,000 years ago, when we focused on what was wrong, we were able to fix it, which then meant that we would stay alive because what was wrong 100,000 years ago could mean death if we don't fix it. So now what happens is the news in this media, not even just the news now, it's also just the media, these stations, the, then they disguise them as talk shows, they disguise them as TV stations, they disguise them as all of these different shows that they put out there. 
are out there putting fear and fear and fear and fear and fear into people. And the reason why is because when you're fearful, you're going to watch more because you want to find the solution to this problem. And the more that you watch these stations, the more money that they're going to make off of ad revenue. If you watch them, you're going, they're going to get more ad revenue. The more millions of people that watch their shows, their TV stations, their news stations, their you know, talk shows, all of those things, the more people that watch them, well, they're going to make more money. So that's the first thing. So you've got to be very clear as to what you're watching and to be very clear, is this something that is supporting me growing into the person that I want to be? Or is this something that's actually holding me back and keeping me in a fearful state? Just simple way to diagnose. Just ask yourself this question. What I'm feeling, what I'm watching right now, how does it make me feel? Right? If you're watching TV and the news happens to pop up and you say, how does this make me feel? And you're like, I feel really worried. I feel very fearful and I don't feel very positive about the direction of the world. Turn it off, like get it off as soon as possible because that's not helping you create the life that you want. That's holding you back. That's keeping you paralyzed. That's immobilizing you versus mobilizing you towards what it is that you want to create, right? So the first thing to be very aware of is that they are putting fear into every person that's out there because it's an easy way to control. The second thing that you have to realize is this, and I'm once again, before I go any further, I'm not saying that the world doesn't have problems. The world definitely has problems. And the world will always have some problems in some sort of way. There's 7.5 billion people on this planet. Are there a few bad apples out there? Are there are a few kooky people that are off the rails? Absolutely. There will never be nothing bad. I don't believe that will ever get to that point. What I'm saying is it is seems way worse than it actually is based off of number one, all of the cameras not now exist in the world because everybody's got a camera inside of their pocket. And number two, how it can be pushed over and over and over again through every platform, through the news, through social media, through everything that you could possibly see. So are, are, is the world perfect? No. Will it ever be? No. But it's nowhere near as bad as they make it seem, right? So that's the first thing to, to be very aware of. The second thing as to why would the media, I don't even just say the news anymore. Why would the media, the stuff you see on TV, talk shows, all of these things, why would they put so much negativity and so much fear-based stuff out there? Reason why is because the easiest way to control people is through fear, guilt, and shame. Let me say that again. The easiest way to control somebody is fear, guilt, and shame. Think about what's been going on the past year and how much fear, guilt, and shame has been put out into the media. It is crazy how much has been put out there, right? And I'm not talking about any side. I don't, I'm not part of any side, just so you guys know. I don't believe in any specific side. I don't think that there is a side to just go for. But when somebody picks a side, as I said earlier, once you pick a side, you now have a side that you're against. Right? If I'm rooting for one basketball team, if I'm watching a game and the Miami Heat are playing and I'm a Heat fan, they're playing another team. That other team I want to lose. So if I'm on one side, whether that's the left or the right or whatever it is that people believe in at this point, I want the other side to lose. And when I want the other side to lose, I'm losing. And the reason why is because when you can, when, when we're, we're split up and divided, it's the, the phrase that we've all heard. United we stand, divided we fall. If we divide as humans, we are easy to control. We are easy. I don't have a side, right? I don't, I don't have a specific side that's that, that, that I believe in or that I think is right or wrong. I think that there's different sides of both of them, but there's another thing that also is very important as well that people don't take into account is that you're seeing the world through your lens of the world based off of everything that has happened to you in your past, right? You're seeing the world. You think the way that you think. You believe what you believe based off of the way that you were raised and circumstances that were presented to you in your life. Let me say that again. You think the way that you think and you believe what you believe based off of the way that you were raised and circumstances that life presented you with. So someone who doesn't believe the exact same thing that you believe and think the exact same way that you think is because of the way they were raised and the circumstances that life presented them with. So it's very important to realize who's to say that if instead of having your life, you had their life, that you wouldn't think exactly the same as them. So 
What I want you to realize is that we need to stop looking at other people and saying, that's the enemy, I'm different than them. This is my side, that's another side. The only thing that we should be doing at this point is focusing on how we can love the other people. Now, this is really interesting because I put up a video on Instagram talking about this the other day. And most people were in full agreement. Yes, we need to figure out a way to love more, to love more, to love more, because the opposite of love is fear. Think about how much, if I, if I don't like the other side, whatever that side is, it's coming from a place of fear, right? Love is the only thing that's going to get us through all of this, right? There is no other way. Battling and picking sides will not solve our problems. Look at our government. If you're in the United States, all they do is just bicker like a bunch of little children, right? Oh, there's this side, there's this side. They're just battling all they're doing. There's no love at all in all of that, right? Closing off will not solve our problems. There is no other side that you can be on. The only side that you can be on right now or ever is human. You are a human, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you believe in, no matter any of those stuff, none of those things matter. What you are is you're a human. And everybody else that's on this planet, all 7.5 billion of them are human as well. When we are divided, we are easily conquered. If you look around and you don't see the things in this world that you currently, if there's certain aspects of this world that you don't like, I completely understand that. But fighting is not going to create something better. What's going to create something better? Figuring out a way to love more, right? To unite, not to divide. When people are united is when things happen. But when we say that's evil, this person's evil, that side's evil, what happens? We get divided. And when you divide, nothing's going to actually happen. Nothing good is going to ha actually happen. Look at, look, at, look at the past hundred years of how much division has happened the past hundred, two hundred years, right? Does it look like it's going in the right direction? Well, probably not. If you watch the news, it looks like it's going in the wrong direction really fast, actually, right? But anything that you've tried to do in the past and, and put somebody into a box, and, and anything that's happened that's put somebody into a box of this is what you believe, this is what I believe, this is what they believe, divides people. And when you are divided, you are easily conquered. So what we need to do is figure out a way to love more. Let me give you an example of what I mean. As I said a few minutes ago, people believe what they believe and they think what they think based off of what has happened to them in the past, what life has brought to them and what they were taught, right? So I might look at somebody and say, you know what? I don't necessarily believe the exact same things that they believe, but does that mean I can't love them or find some sort of love for them? It might be hard sometimes, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. It means it's something that we got to work towards, right? So you look at, and you've heard the phrase, love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor, love your neighbor. When we're divided, nothing's gonna happen that's gonna be, in, gonna be good. But when we unite and we can work through our problems, we can work through things that are going on, that's when things actually, that's when things actually start to change. Right? So if I look at somebody and I say, okay, this person, I don't agree with much of what they said. Actually, I don't agree with most of what they said, but I didn't have their life. I didn't have them circ their circumstances. I didn't have any of the things that they had. So if I was in their exact same shoes and I went through the exact same life that they had, would I think the same as them? And there's a possibility that I would, which means that how can I say I'm better than them and that my opinion and my, my stance is better than them? I can look at them and I can say, you know what? I don't agree with them, not 100%. There's some things that we definitely on other sides, but I can love them either way. Why can I love them? Because number one, I'm an empathetic person. We all have empathy and we can always be empathetic towards other people and what they've been through in their lives, right? Number two, if I want things to actually change, I need to be able to look at someone who doesn't agree the same things as me and say, I can still love them through this. I can figure out a way to, to, for us to work together. That's the only way that this is going to work. And I could say, okay, if I go, come from a place of love, when I go and speak to this person, they're more receptive to listening to me and to listening to my side. If I go from a place of hate and a place of anger, they are way less likely to listen to me. And what are they going to do? They're going to build up their walls and they're going to push their side further. So if we really want to have an intelligent, intellectual, you know, adult conversation, maybe I should come from a place of love first and not a place from division and hatred towards them come from a place of love. And that would make them more receptive to actually listening to what it is that I have to say. Maybe that's a way that we can actually get them to change. 
Because if what they've been taught and what they what life has presented them with, what if I come from a place of love and present them with a different option and present them with something different? Maybe then that would change them in some sort. Maybe it wouldn't. But in reality, I know that if we come from a place of love in everything that we do, life is going to be a lot better. And that's the thing that the world is missing. So what I want you to realize is that right now, there seems to be a war for your mind. You're in control of all of the things that you watch, all of the things that you listen to, all of the people that you hang out with, the music that you listen to, the media that you consume, whether that's visually, auditorily, the people that you hang out with, you know, you're in control of all of those things and all of those things brainwash you in some sort of way. The question is, is it brainwashing you to become the person that you want to become or is it brainwashing you to hold you back and not get you to move forward, right? All I know is that when I walked into that paint store and I saw those three to four minutes, I was like, oh my God. I literally physically did not feel good in my body and I was like, I gotta get out of here as quick as possible. Because number one, I could see what it was doing to me and number two, I could see what it's doing to other people who aren't necessarily paying attention and who don't have this knowledge as well. So just be, number one, come from a place of love. Be very loving in everything that you do. And number two, realize you're in control of the information that comes into your head. Be in control of it. Be very diligent about what you allow to come into your head. Number three, look at everyone else around you and realize that if I pick a side and if I become divisive, we're easily conquered. The only way that we're going to change this world into becoming the world that we want to be is we have to first become that change. If we want people to get along more than they're getting along now, we need to first be the people who start getting along with people. If we want people, people to be more loving, we need to first be the people that are more loving. Gandhi said it, still makes sense. Be the change you want to see in the world. What do you need to do and change within yourself to be the change that you want to see in the world? What change do you want to see in the world and how can you take that and put it inside of you? There's a war for your mind going on. Be in control of what's actually coming into your head. Be in control of every thought that you think, every action that you take, and come from a place of love in every single thing that you do. And I promise you, that'll be the first step towards a better world. I had put up yesterday a uh, Instagram and Facebook stories poll. And I put up a couple different things. And one of them said, do you think aliens exist? Yes or no. Uh, is money the root of all evil? Yes or no. And then one of them said, do you think the world is getting better or worse? And I was super surprised to find that 78% of the people who follow me think that the world is getting worse. Yeah, I was super surprised by that. And the reason why is because I think that the, typically the people who follow me tend to be more optimistic versus pessimistic. And so I wanted to dive into the issue to talk about my viewpoints of if I think the world is getting better or worse, because I was super surprised. And what I think is I think the world is getting better, but I think the world is going through an awakening. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Let's say that somebody is 50 years old, right? And they don't take care of their body. They eat whatever it is they want to eat. They eat greasy food. They eat really sugary food, lots of caffeine, just bunch of crap into their body. They don't care about anything that, you know, they just literally eat whatever it is that they want to eat. Nothing healthy. Okay. Let's also say that they don't ever work out. Never. They've worked out in years and years and years. And let's say they're overweight, 30, 40, 50, 70, hundred pounds of weight. I don't know what it is, but let's say they're overweight because of the fact they haven't been taking care of themselves. And they also don't get much sleep. They don't get good sleep. And then one day that person has a heart attack and the heart attack luckily doesn't kill them but it does give them a heart attack. They do have a heart attack. Heart attack isn't fun, I'm sure. Never had one before, but I'm sure it probably isn't the most fun thing in the world. So you look at this and you say, after years and years and years of abuse and neglect and not treating their body right, their body has a heart attack. And because of that heart attack, the person wakes up and they go, oh my God, like I almost just died. I'm now becoming aware of how I haven't been taking care of my body. I haven't been treating it right. I haven't been giving it the right fuel. I have been just eating stuff for taste and not for actual health reasons. I haven't worked out in God knows long how it's been since I've worked out. I don't get any sleep. I don't get good sleep. I drink a lot of alcohol. And all of that over years and years and years and years has accumulated to this one moment of me having a heart attack. Now, I have a choice. Either I can go back to life as it was, or 
I can make some different choices based on my heart attack. And let's say that person decides, you know what? I want to live long enough to see my daughter walk down the aisle. I want to live long enough to be able to be a grandfather that ends up being able to play with his, his grandkids and go to their sports games and be able to continue to travel. And I want to live longer than just past the age of 60 years old. I want to live to 85, 90. What would it look like for me to live to 90 and see my grandkids get married as well? And they start to take care of themselves. They start eating healthy. Maybe they hire a nutritionist. They hire the nutritionist and take care of their body. They hire someone that, that teaches them how to work out and the right ways to move. They start figuring out ways to improve their sleep and they read books around improving their sleep. And because of this, this heart attack, their entire life shifts because they now woke up to how they have been treating their body. Why do I bring this up? Well, why don't you just think about what we've been going through? And actually, before we, we dive into what we've been going through, if somebody were to have a heart attack and then switch their entire lives around and change for the better and lived longer and was able to see their, their daughter walk down the aisle and be able to hang out with their grandkids and have a better life and be healthier and happier and better sleep and all of that stuff, is the heart attack still bad? Or was the heart attack the thing, the good thing that came in to awaken this person from the sleep that they were in and the, the neglect that they were giving their body. And now, ah, that's amazing because you know what? Now I can treat my body the right way. And that heart attack woke them up is what you can say. It is their awakening from everything that they were going through. Now, is a heart attack bad? Or was maybe the heart attack a blessing? Was the heart attack something that actually ended up being good because in the long term, it changed them? And I think basically what we're in right now is the middle of a heart attack, right? I'm assuming that when you go through a heart attack, it's not very fun. No one's like, holy shit, this is great. I'm having a heart attack. It's usually people are probably freaking out. It probably hurts a lot. It's probably something that you don't want to go through. But if you think about what we're going through and the heart attack that we're going through, the amazing thing about it is that we're now starting to wake up to everything that is wrong in the world that we need to fix. And this isn't me saying this, I take this side of this. I don't take any side in politics or any of that stuff. In my opinion, doesn't matter because everyone has an opinion. So it's just me talking from just a, this is the way that I view the world. We're now waking up to old, oppressive and evil systems that are being brought to the surface. And a lot of people who were not aware of them are now aware that there's a lot of things happening that maybe they weren't aware of, maybe different racial things, maybe different gender things. It's becoming apparent that some people have been held down by society. It's been apparent that maybe some people don't get 100% equal opportunities, like group A might not get the same opportunity as group B based off of where they lived or where they grew up in the, the, the school that they were able to go to in the education system that they had. It's becoming aware how our government is not set up for the people's best interest, but maybe their own. And people are starting to become very aware of these things, like a heart attack that wakes you up and goes, holy shit, something's not right. But in turn, now we're in the middle of a time where things can start to shift, things can start to change. So is having a heart attack fun? Probably not. I don't think anybody's ever, I've never heard of somebody using the, the adjective as fun for a heart attack. But does it seem like sometimes if you're in the middle of a heart attack, it's hitting the fan? Probably. But if you live through the heart attack, you make changes you change your life, you change your lifestyle, did it turn out to be a good thing? My rebuttal would be yes. I do think, my argument would be yes. I think that it is something that helped. A heart attack is an awakening for bad health in most cases. Obviously there's circumstances outside that where someone just has heart problems, but in most cases, a heart attack is an awakening to bad health, right? Civil unrest is an awakening to how we should look at the systems that we have and see if we can make them better for all people. So the same way that a heart attack wakes up somebody who hasn't been taking care of their health, civil unrest wakes up the public to how we should be treating people and start to change our systems and processes. Make sense? So another thing <clears throat> that we should consider when we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the way that the world looks really bad right now is that you have to realize we're seeing a lot more footage, a lot more videos, a lot more pictures 
than we ever have of things that are bad that are happening in the world. Are there things that are bad are happening in the world? Absolutely. Are there more than there ever have been? Absolutely not. And I'm going to share some statistics with you around that in just a little while to tell you that. But I think what you also re have to realize is that if you were to rewind 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 99% of people did not have a phone or, I, I mean, actually not even take phone. They didn't even have a camera to take pictures. If you would have talked to somebody 20 years ago and be like, yeah, I take pictures with my phone. They'd be like, yeah, you're fucking crazy. Cause that would make no sense to somebody 20 years ago, right? A phone was made to make phone calls. But if you just think about that, now every single person has a camera in their pocket at all times. They can take pictures of anything. So things that were kind of under the surface and hidden a long time ago are now coming to the surface and they have to come to the surface just like a heart attack so that you can be able to work through them. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing that I want you to consider is that now there's a lot more cameras than there ever have been. So if you're seeing more things and thinking that the world is worse because of that, you just have to realize there's just a lot more cameras than there ever have been. And once again, I'm gonna go over the statistics in just a minute. I think they're gonna kind of surprise you. Another thing that, I, that has shifted a lot in the past 20, 30 years is that the news used to be something that you could trust. The news had no, the news had no hidden agenda. Now we all know that they have their own agendas that they want to push to you. And so they're pushing them. Another thing that you can actually start to think about is the rise of social media. In my opinion, social media is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It is just a thing. And the human condition is now coming out through social media. But the interesting thing about social media is that social media makes it easier to share information faster and more widespread than any time in humankind. So if it was 30 years ago and you saw something with your own eyes that was bad that happened in front of you, the only people you could really tell is you could, I guess you could call the cops, you could tell your neighbors, you could tell your family. But right now, if something were to happen bad in front of your eyes and you were to videotape it and put it up on Facebook and put it up on Instagram, it could immediately go viral. Millions or hundreds of millions of people could see it. News groups could take, pick it up and then it would be all over the place. So it's not that things are getting worse, it's just that the darkness is coming to light because we are able to share this information quicker than ever before. And to dive into the statistics, which I want to share with you guys, it, it's super interesting, is this. So there's a, um, I did my own research on this and there's also a Harvard psychologist. He's a, a cognitive psychologist named Steven Pinker. He's actually got a couple books about, and a TED talk about how the world is getting safer and it's better than it ever has been. It just seems like it's not based off of the fact that we have a lot of information that we can share, pictures, videos, immediately. If you go to the Department of Justice's website, on the Department of Justice's website, if you look at statistics, firearm homicides are down 39% from 1993. So if you look at it, you think, oh my gosh, there's so many more people dying from guns. There's actually 39% less people than there were in 1993, you know, and it continues to go down year over year. I'm not here to argue firearms, so don't even think that that's what I'm trying to get across. I'm just trying to give you plain and simple statistics to show you that the world is actually getting better, right? To make you feel better about, ah, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. Maybe it is actually starting to get better. Uh, Non-fatal firearm accidents are down 69%. So non-fatal firearm accidents are down 69%. The numbers of people who are murdered on a yearly basis in the United States is down. And now you might say, okay, well, what about outside of the United States? I understand there's, there's places where things have gotten worse and they've gotten better and things have gotten worse and things have gotten better. But if you look at the world collectively as a whole, and I understand there's gonna be some anomalies to this, everybody. But if you look at the world collectively as a whole, the number of people killed in war is one twelfth of what it was in the 1950s and the 1960s. So you literally have to look at that and go, wow, one twelfth of what it was before 60, 70 years ago. So now, right now, is the safest time to be alive as a human. Is it perfect? Hell no, absolutely not. But what I think we're going through is a little bit of a heart attack. We're starting to realize some of the ways that we weren't taking care of our quote unquote body, other people's bodies, our system, our, you know, the body that we are all a part of, the governments that we're a part of, the local areas we're a part of, the nations we're a part of, and the world that we're a part of, we're starting to become very aware of old, evil, oppressive systems, and they're very blatantly in front of us now, and we're now able to start to work through those things. So is it the most comfortable time to be alive? Absolutely not. Will it get better? 
Will there be something good that comes out of all of this? I tend to be an optimistic person, so I think yes. And I would like to argue that with anybody. I think that it is getting better. Statistically, it's showing it's getting better. There's books that are written on it getting better. Is everything perfect? Absolutely not. There is no way you will ever hear me say that everything is perfect. And I don't think humans are perfect. Therefore, I don't think everything ever will be perfect. But I tend to lean towards the side of everything is working for me, not against me. The world is working for me, not to me. And if that's the case, I also feel the world is working for you and not to you. It's never working against you. It's always working towards your side. So is it perfect? Absolutely not. But what I would recommend is this. If you're starting to feel the feelings of, of the world being heavy, of the news being heavy, of stuff that's happening in society being heavy, turn off the news. The news is not there to support you. It's not there to inform you. I promise you that. I've done episodes before about how the news is literally just there to make you not informed, but conformed. And they put out a bunch of negativity because your brain is addicted to negativity because that's how the human species survived. So turn off the news if you're starting to feel like the world is heavy. Turn off social media if you're starting to feel like things are heavy as well. Go out and experience the world. Walk outside, look at the sun, and you'll realize, man, things aren't as bad as they seem to be when you watch them on the news. On the, on the screens, everything seems to be collapsing. When you walk outside of your house, it tends to be a lot better. And I'm a very optimistic person, so I think we're going in the right direction. I think we have a lot of work to do. I think there's a lot of things that still need to work, be, be worked through. But you have to realize that everything that comes into your brain influences the way that you feel. Everything that you see influences the way that you feel. Everything that you hear influences the way that you feel. Every person that you talk to influences the way that you feel. Everything that you read on social media or see on TV is going to influence the way that you feel. And in turn, that kind of brainwashes you to be a certain way. So if you're thinking of it this way, if, if every single thing that comes into our brain, in a way, brainwashes us to feel a certain way, why don't we take control of our, our own brainwashing? Why don't I go, you know what? I'm not gonna look at the news today. I'm not gonna turn on social media today. I'm gonna read a book. I'm gonna watch some YouTube videos from some motivational speakers or from some psychologist or neurologist or whatever it is you're trying to learn from and be in control of your own brainwashing. Because I promise you this, if you're not in control of it yourself, you're still being brainwashed. Is it the brainwashing that you want? I would prefer to wake up and say, I'm in control of my own brainwashing. I'm gonna put on the music I like, I'm gonna listen to the podcasts I like, I'm gonna read the books that I like, I'm not gonna turn on the news, I'm not gonna turn on social media, and I'm gonna hang out with the people that I like. Because ultimately, that's the way that we get better. So is the world getting worse? I don't think that it is. I just think that we're in the middle of a heart attack. And I feel like on the other side of this heart attack, the world will be better. People are gonna work it out. We're gonna figure it out. And the evil, old, and oppressive systems will be worked through and released. And we'll be on our way towards a better society and hopefully better human connection. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you wanna learn even more about mastering your mind, click right here and watch this video as well. If you continue to eat what the media and news feeds you and all that negativity, you're going to have to deal with the sickness that comes from it.